So I just want to read uh, this article that was written. Uh, it's called Making Indians White, the Judicial Abolition of Native Slavery in Revolutionary Virginia and its Racial Legacy. So it's here in the introduction. In 1772, George Mason, later famous as the father of the Bill of Rights, represented a slave named Robin and 11 other enslaved plaintiffs in the General Court of Virginia. The colony's highest court, the slaves claimed that maternal descent from an American Indian made their enslavement illegal. So there's, they were fighting that they were Indians and shouldn't be enslaved. And Mason marshaled arguments from natural law and statutory history to support the contention. In a terse one paragraph opinion typical of the era, the court agreed freeing the plaintiffs and ordering their former masters to pay them nominal damages. So you hear that these uh, so-called, uh, they were being tagged and labeled as slaves. They went to court. They were able to prove they were American Indians. And the court agreed, right, Flip, freeing them and actually paying them back for any damages, right? So this court case was called the Robin versus Hardaway. This was from 1772, if you want to look it up, All right? Freedom suits were common in colonial Virginia. Although defined as property for almost all legal purposes and denied rights of citizenship, slaves could allege illegal enslavement and sue for their freedom. So did you know slaves could sue for their freedom? Courts recognized such claims throughout the slaveholding South from slavery 17th century beginning, so we're talking about the 1600s, onward. These suits offered one of the few routes to manumission in early America. The ordinary posture of the Robin versus Hardaway case, though, belied its extraordinary result. The court's decision marked a watershed in the legal history of Virginian slavery. It was the first recorded holding of an Anglo-American court that maternal descent from American Indian alone established the right to freedom. This outcome was remarkable in the context of early America, where despite present-day conceptions that all slaves were Africans, Indian slavery was ubiquitous. All right, you hear that? Not all the slaves were so-called Africans or people they were bringing uh, from the Caribbean. Indian slaves could be found in all 13 mainland British colonies in 1772. So again, this article has footnotes, right? And you can see the sources, a lot of verified scholarly university legal sources. All right, so... That's why I'm reading this article. Continue says, In Virginia alone, thousands of descendants of enslaved Indians toiled alongside African slaves on the plantations. Thousands of descendants of enslaved Indians. Robin versus Hardaway rep repudiated this history and deemed the previously common institution illegal in all but a few circumstances, inaugurating a line of cases that culminated in 1806. In the end, Virginia court concluded that enslaved descendants of Native Americans were prima facie free, judicially abolishing Indian slavery in Virginia. This precedent spread throughout the antebellum period, 
Courts in Connecticut, Louisiana, Missouri, New Jersey, South Carolina, and Tennessee all grappled with Virginia's decisions and debated whether maternal descent from American Indians was sufficient to establish freedom. Explaining this shift in the racial basis of slavery and more difficult than observing it, the Robin Court and its successors claimed merely to be engaged in statutory interpretation and Mason argued for Indians' freedom on the basis of the libertarian principles of the Revolutionary War. This comment argues, however, that the ultimate grounds for this doctrinal innovation lay deeper in the changing demographics of early America. Although not the judge's conscious motivation, Robin and his progeny solidified chattel slavery rather than weakening it. By making Indians legally white, you hear that? By making Indians legally white or black, as we shall see in some instances, the court erased a complex triracial past and created instead a society legally divided into the stark categories of free whites and enslaved blacks. This erasure has present-day legal consequences for federal tribal recognition, struggles over tribal membership, and interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause. And we see this a lot going on right now. To understand the nature of this transformation, this comment builds on two previously unconnected bodies of scholarship. A growing literature on early American history examines the formerly neglected role of Indian slavery and argues that the institution was far more widespread and important than previously thought. All right, so you hear that. We're getting this from another person that, you know, Indians were being enslaved, not just so-called Negroes or so-called Africans. These works rely heavily on court records, deeds, and other legal sources and acknowledge the law's importance and passing, but they neglected the legal history narrative. By ending their chronologies in the mid-18th century, they overlooked the complex judicial debate over the legacy of Indian slavery and revolutionary and antebellum America. By contrast, freedom suits, including those involving plaintiffs, claiming Indian descent have received sustained analysis from legal historians as part of a larger literature on cases of racial determination in which the central and often sole legal issue was a person's racial status. In these instances, faced with the reality of a mixed-race society that rarely aligned with legal categories, courts turned to a variety of methods, appearance, ancestry, science, and reputation to classify ambiguous individuals, thus laying bare to historical criticism. The constructed and arbitrary nature of legal conceptions are of race. Robin and its progeny, though, fit uneasily into the conceptual framework. First, as with American legal history, more broadly, the current scholarship on racial determination focuses primarily on the period between independence and the civil war war. This periodization ignores the first 200 years of racial construction in America, making cases such as Robin the grapple with the colonial legal legacy unintelligible. So what she's basically saying is that they really only took us back to a certain uh, period of time. They didn't go further back because if we really went further back, we will see what was going on with the Na American natives and how they were becoming slaves or Negroes or classified as white and how much, uh, you know, Indian slavery was really going on. But they don't take us back that far when we're in school learning in, the, in these classes, American history. Yeah. Second, Robin and its progeny were not racial determination cases. Their outcomes hinged on the legal consequences of Indian descent, not on the plaintiff's racial identity, which both sides usually acknowledge as Indian. They were applications of racial ideology, rather than determination of racial identity. Since the literature on neither Indian slavery nor racial determination alone provides a complete account of Robin and its context, this comment draws on both to understand fully the causes and significance of the doctrinal transformation and racial construction that the case epitomizes. In particular, this comment argues that the racial formations of the antebellum United States cannot be understood without reference to its earlier colonial history. The black-white di divide that emerged during the revolutionary period was neither natural nor 
organic. So that started in the revolutionary period. We're talking about the 1770s, 1700s. Rather, it represented a conscious repudiation of an earlier triracial era by judiciary anxious to reinforce race-based slavery. To support these contentions, this comment is divided into four sections. Part one discusses the colonial history of Indian slavery and race in early American, broadly and in Virginia specifically. Part two dwells more deeply into Robin and its successors, examining the evolution of the court's reasoning on the legality of Indian slavery. Part three probes the various explanations for the decision to grant freedom to enslaved Indians. And finally, part four explores the legacy of these cases in the antebellum United States, as well as the implications for contemporary legal issues surrounding tribal recognition, tribal membership, and the Equal Protection Clause. All right, so this was the introduction. So part one, again, the hidden history of Indian slavery in Virginia. And it says here, A, the origins of Indian slavery in early America, the prevalence of African slavery in North America, was not inevitable. That's your own hijack. The fantastic prosperity of Spanish South America rested on forced Indian labor. Again, the Spanish were enslaving Indians. They weren't bringing Africans. They were enslaving Indians. that the Spanish and Portuguese were bringing Indians by the thousands to Europe, West Africa, and all the rest of their colonies in America. All right. Although Spanish colonists employed labels other than slavery for these practices, after the crown abolished Indian enslavement in the 16th century. So what they're talking about is that they gave different terms. They weren't calling these people slaves, these Indians. They were calling them uh, indentured servants or encomiendas in Spanish, which means like in a loan, like you have a loan or a contract. I and an envying Mexico and Peru, the first English theorists and colonizers envisioned freeing the oppressed natives from Spanish tyranny. So listen to what they're saying. They're saying that the English were paying close attention to the Spanish, right? And the Portuguese. They're not naming the Portuguese here, but they were seeing what they were doing, which was enslaving the Indians and having free labor and building their uh, co colonies with these uh, Indians and enslaving them, having them work in the sugar cane plantations and stuff. And this is before so-called slavery. This is before the plantations in the United States, all right? I'm talking about the Caribbean, Jamaica, and all these places, Central America, Mexico. And uh, even down in the South, the Spanish had a lot of colonies there in Florida, all the way up to... Uh, the Carolinas. These newly emancipated Indians, the English dreamed, would gladly work for them, helping create an English empire of, pros of prosperity. So you hear that. So the English were envisioning saving you from the Spanish. And in return, they were saying, they were dreaming, it says here, that you would gladly work for them, helping create an English empire of prosperity. And you know what they're talking about? They're talking about that they made you indentured servants. You had a contract. So I guess they were saying, we'll free you from these uh, Spanish and Portuguese people who are uh, brutally enslaving you. And you can come work for us to help build, right, <laughs> the the empire, the English empire of prosperity or the 13 colonies, right? And um, so they'd get you into this contract. So I guess uh, what I want to show you is that, and what I'm going to show you is that slavery did not start how we think. By what I mean is they didn't go over there to Africa, kidnap a bunch of people in chains, brought them over in ships, which to come work over here on this side of America to, in, in a type of chattel slavery. That did not happen. These people had contracts, these first indentured servants, these first so-called slaves, Indians had contracts, indentured servants, not only the Indians or the Negroes, right? We're talking about you. But white people as well coming from Europe, they didn't just get a free ride over here. They had to sign contracts, seven-year contract. They were indentured servants. They were working alongside with you. The, yet the realities of Roanoke and Jamestown disappointed colonizers. Too weak to overawe 
the Algonquins they encountered, English settlers found themselves Indian dependents, not their masters. They were forced to rely on the tribes for food and basic survival. So these early colonists needed you to survive. Do you remember when you helped them? Far from empires of wealth and power, the first English colonies were, were wards of native hospitality. These early encounters established a general pattern of interaction even after the settlers gained strength. As independent native tribes resisted, English efforts to reduce them to vassalage, warfare, not enslavement, was the fate of most recalcitrant natives whose susceptibility to European diseases, diseases also made them a poor source of labor in English eyes. Yet the desperate shortage of workers in a society whose wealth depended on manpower meant that colonists readily employed native laborers where available in the 17th century. Colonial economy. Whether the colonists regarded these Indians as nominally free servants or as slaves is unclear and was largely irrelevant because high mortality rates made such a hazy distinction meaningless. Indians, regardless of status, were bought and sold throughout Chesapeake for the value of their labor. Again, who was getting bought and sold in Chesapeake? Right? You, Indians, it says. Indians were bought and sold throughout the Chesapeake for the value of their labor. But as life expectancy increased, the legal categories became clearer. By 1648, courts in Maryland were making references to Indian slaves. Indian slavery remained a small-scale institution localized in the Chesapeake until the late 17th century, when a series of conflicts resulted in its rapid expansion in the English colonies. In the wake of King Philip's War in New England, for instance, and we're talking about uh, them the, the warring with the Pe Pequot up there in New England, Colonists enslaved hundreds of defeated Algonquins, hundreds, most of whom were quickly sold and sent out of the country, primarily to the West Indies. All right, so where what was going on? New England Algonquin-speaking people were being enslaved by the hundreds and taken to the West Indies, and we know this. We can ha we have people who can trace their family that it's in Barbados all the way back to Massachusetts. They know they were the Pequots. I've been contacted by people telling me their story. All right. So who was in the West Indies? These are supposed to be so-called Negroes in Barbados and on Bahamas and Providence Island off the coast of Nicaragua. We've already got that in part three, right? You know, these, and these same people were being called cannibal Negroes. So they were calling the Pequot cannibal Negroes. They're ending up in the West Indies, right? We are told that the West Indies was full of so-called Africans. If you're black, they said they told us that they were Africans. But we're already finding out these were a lot of these were all Indians. In Virginia, too, witnessed a search in Indian slaves after Bacon's rebellion. Yet the institution developed most dramatically in South Carolina, which was founded comparatively late in 1670. There, in the closest parallel to the African slave trade in the Western Hemisphere, English traders actively encouraged tribes to war against each other and enslaved the captives, who were then sold primarily to the ever-hungry Caribbean labor market. All right, so not just the Pequots, right? Many Native people especially in South Carolina, were being enslaved and sent, right, mainly to the Caribbean uh, labor market. By the early 18th century, this Indian slave trade had become the colony's primary economic activity, with some 30,000 to 50,000 Indians enslaved. Only the devastating Tuscarora and Jamasi Wars of 17. 15 and 18 turned the colony to the less risky, although scarcely less violent, practice of plantation agriculture. 
While the peace of the 1720s ended the long pattern of warfare and Indian enslavement, the legacy of the earlier era persisted. Although many enslaved natives had been sold to the West Indies, many others remained in England's mainland colonies. All right, so many were sent to the Caribbean, but a lot of you, what, are still there. Where? In, in England's mainland colonies, in all the colonies, the South, the North, all the 13 colonies, you are still there. There they blended with the far larger population of African slaves, Dodge the Hijack, which had grown dramatically in the late 17th and early 18th centuries with the expansion of the Atlantic slave trade, Dodge the Hijack. On the new plantation complex, a society that defied easy racial categorization emerged, a hybrid of native and African cultures. Mm -hmm. While this melange reflected the triracial tri world of its inhabitants, early American society behind the frontier moved towards a stark black-white division. So you were either black or white. Gradually, making the descendants of enslaved natives as anomaly the eyes of Anglo-Americans. Point B, the legal history of Indian slavery in Virginia. The legal status of all non-white servants and slaves in early 17th century Virginia was vague because there was neither statutes nor common law doctrines defining enslavement. Slavery existed without positive state sanction. Not until 1661 did the House of Burgess says, enact the first statute that obliquely recognized the existence of slavery. Despite this legal ambiguity, a flourishing trade in Indians existed in the Chesapeake by the 1640s, 1640s, Indians being enslaved, all right? As the people whom the courts now labeled as Indian slaves were bought and sold throughout Virginia and Maryland. Who was bought and sold throughout Virginia and Maryland? Indian slaves. Again, Indian slaves. To the Indian laborers present in the colony from the beginning, the increasing tendency to label them slaves rather than servants was probably irre irrelevant. For coercion and force were always the realities of their existence. So whether you were a servant or a slave, they were treating you the same like if you were in Chattel slavery already, regardless of the law. The first group of Indians, servants, mentioned in the Virginia records, a group of Caribs imported from the Caribbean were ordered, hanged till they be dead, after they allegedly attempted to kill several Anglo-Virginians and then fled to local tribes. Unsurprisingly, the court thereafter required bond that Indians would not run away again so who were they bringing up remember she said earlier that they were mixing with africans but she just admitted right now that the first group of indian servants mentioned in the virginia records a group of caribs we already know what the caribs look like right so-called negro imported from the caribbean not from africa from the caribbean right and what happened to them they were hanged till they be dead. Who was being hanged? Right? Who was being hanged? All right. So we know who the Indian and the Caribs are, right? Continuing, says, these early slaves came from several sources. One was capture and war, the primary justification for enslavement in the 17th century. A lot of the times they were just lying. They were going into... Uh, towns of uh, Indian towns and just enslaving everybody and then telling the other people that they had uh, been prisoners of war when and they never went to war with them. The authorizations of several military expeditions in Virginia and Maryland specifically provided that captured natives would be the spoils of the financial backers. Another was court-ordered slavery often the result of Indians' inability to pay fines for their wrongdoing. However, the evidence suggests that most frequently, Indians were purchased from other Indians. All right? Your own people were selling you. While this sometimes consisted of explicit sell into slavery, 
often native parents endangered their children to work as servants. Again, native parents endangered their children to work as servants, usually for long terms. In 1655, the Burgesses passed an act that legalized this process and allowed masters to agree with children's parents on the length of indenture. Ostensibly, the law was enacted to educate and assimilate native children, but later enactments acknowledged the exploited, exploitative reality. So it was supposed to right, educate them, assimilate them into their society, the white people, but they were really enslaving them. They turned them into child slaves, these little kids, these native children. In 1658, the assembly noted that sundry colonists have corrupted some of the Indians to steal and convey away some of the children of other Indians. You hear that? And others who pretended to have bought or purchased Indians of their parents have violently and fraudulently forced them away to great scandal of Christianity and of the English nation. It further proclaimed that no person or persons whatsoever shall dare or presume to buy any Indian or Indians from or of the English upon pain of substantial fine. Other laws barred masters from assigning or transferring their indentured Indian, again, indentured Indian children to any other whatsoever and prohibited traders who imported any Indians as servants from selling them for slaves or for any longer time than English of the like ages should serve by act of assembly. So what did they just say there? That there was also English children, right, being uh, or considered servants or indentured servants. So they were making sure that the Indian children were being applied the same uh, laws and rights as the English-like ages, right, of or the, of the colonist children. These statutes simultaneously acknowledged the existence of Indian slavery and attempted to redress it. So there were so many laws because there were so many Indians getting enslaved that they had to make laws to protect most of them because they were just getting them and enslaving them. Despite these aspirations, the evidence suggests that these laws rarely enforced did little to remedy, remedy the rampant exploitation of Indian servants. There you go. In one 18th century case, for instance, a Maryland man named Andrews faced a complaint that he had sold or otherwise disposed of an Indian boy, a son of one of our friend Indians. The case revealed that James, the Indian in question, was not legally a slave, but rather a servant indentured in Virginia, whose father had received a horse bridle and saddle and two suits of cloths in return for 30 years of his son's labor. A Andrews replied that it is a customary thing in Virginia for the Indians to work among the inhabitants and to indent with them for a time or term of years. Although Andrews' claim failed to win over the Maryland court, Andrews was fined and imprisoned for a day. The case underscores that Virginian custom routinely floated statutory pro prohibitions supposedly protecting indentured native servants, indentured native servants bought and sold in the open marketplace, bought and sold in the marketplace, consigned to servitude turns far longer than the five-year average for English of like ages. So you hear that, right? So-called Native Americans, right, were being uh, put into this indentured servitude alongside the English, right? English meaning white people or Europeans were also indentured servants, not just Indians or so-called Negroes. The thing is, as it says here, that they were serving far longer terms or at most of the time they weren't given, uh, you know, the freedom after the contract was over, but they were given most of them longer terms than the actual children of the uh, colonists or the like ages of the English, it says here, right? And rarely protected by a weak and disinterested state. Indians such as James easily slid from servitude into slavery. It's so important, right? Who were these indentured servants, really? The history is going to teach us that 
the first so-called slaves were actually indentured servants. And we're talking about Negroes. But right here in this article is telling us that the indentured servants were the Indians. These weren't Africans. Right? In the late 17th century, the colonial legislature attempted to clarify the ambiguities of Indian slavery by institutionalizing it. Previously, Indian bondage had existed largely outside the law. Indians who appeared before the courts were assumed to be servants, even if they routinely served 30-year terms. In 1670, the Burgesses, noting that some dispute have arisen whether Indians taken in war are servants for life or term of years, attempted to solve the conflict by creating two clear categories. All non-Christian servants who arrived in the colony by shipping primarily Africans, right, dodged the hijack, because we already read the Caribbeans, right, were being brought up, but occasionally Indians arriving by sea were decreed slaves for their lives. Okay, so who was also in these ships arriving by sea in ships, so-called Negro, was Indians as well, as she's letting you know. And they were decreed slaves for their lives. Indian slaves for lives. Who was working in the plantations? Those who came by land, in parentheses, usually hostile Indians would serve until the age of 30 or, if already adults, no longer than 12 years. Yeah, you hear this? So the contract, there was contracts. It would, you would gain your freedom after that. Why do you think there's so much free people of color or free Negroes or free blacks? Because they weren't slaves a lot of the time. Well, most of you weren't slaves or servants at all, but when you did become a servant, so-called slave, and your contract ended, you were free. You even got land. You All of a sudden, you can gain land, buy land and stuff. This resolution distinguished the principle of Indian servitude from outright slavery. Although savvy slave traders easily avoided its ambiguous provisions. So again, in the footnotes, right? We're talking about native people coming in ships. So in the footnote, again, right, it says number 62, anecdotal evidence suggests that not insubstantial number of native slaves arrived by sea. So they're saying not a little bit of Indian, a lot, substantial. When it says not insubstantial, so it means substantial number of native slaves arrived by sea in ships. Native slaves arrived to America in ships rather than by land. And it says, see example, but versus racial, right? It says, um, in 1813, freeing the descendants of Native American Indian slave imported from Jamaica. What? Who's coming in ships? In American Indians from Jamaica. All right? And continuing in the footnote, it says, involving the transportation of slaves from the Caribbean, again, the Car Carib Indians, we already got that. Moreover, Indian slaves were often transported by boat within the Chesapeake Bay, uh, Bay, making it easy to follow the statute by bringing slaves by shipping. This solution did not last. In 1676, Bacon's Rebellion triggered a paroxysm of violence and hatred against natives. To gain recruits, Bacon's assembly proclaimed that all Indians taken in war would be held and accounted slaves during life. Although this law was repealed, along with all the Bacon's laws, the legitimate assembly reenacted it three years later. Finally, in 1682, the Burgesses, recognizing the chaotic and unstable coexistence of these contradictory laws, explicitly repealed a former law making Indians and others free. Instead, the assembly declared that all Indians which shall hereafter be sold by our neighboring Indians or any other trafficking with us as for slaves are hereby adjudged, deemed, and taken to be slaves to all intents and purposes. Any law, usage, or custom to the contrary, notwithstanding, at last, the legislature had clarified the fraught legal status of Indian laborers. They would henceforth be slaves, not servants. All right? 1682. Again, they would be henceforth be slaves, not servants. Who became slaves? American Indians. They're not servants anymore. 
The law of 1682 was the last time the House of Burgesses legislated for Indian servants or slaves alone. Afterwards, laws addressed a single category of Negroes and other slaves. You see how they changed your category, your tag, your classification. Virginia Slave Code of 1705, and we're talking about the Black Code in Virginia, and we've already come across that, right? Imposed numerous restrictions, not only on enslaved Africans and Indians, but on free people of color as well. Who is the free people of color? We already know this, right? We're talking about Indians, you, right? Color, people of color, colored, colored only, right? Again, Virginia Slave Code of 1705 imposed numerous restrictions, not only on enslaved Africans and Indians, but on free people of color as well. Statues lumped them into a single category of any Negro, Mulatto, or Indian. So you see what's going on, right? The pattern, right? Repetitive information is going to stick to you. You're going to see how you became Mulatto, Negro, Black, eventually african-american so again it says statues lumped them into a single category of any negro mulatto or indian prohibited them from holding office owning slaves or intermarrying with whites and subjected them to 30 lashes for any resistance against whites you're getting whipped who was getting whipped who's getting hung who's getting bought and sold indians with distinct tribal identities and cultures continued to exist in the Virginian legal imagination, but only outside the confines of Anglo-American society, where they were the subject of statutes and treaties to regulate cross-cultural diplomacy and trade. By contrast, Indians within English society, whether slave or free, were relegated to an undifferentiated underclass along with Africans and mixed race peoples, Tash the hijack, where their race denied them the legal privileges of whiteness. Consigned to increasingly marginal economic importance amid the ever expanding numbers of African slaves, enslaved oh. natives blended into the plantation's black community. Black in parentheses, you know, black is a crayon color. Right? They're saying you blended into <laughs> the black. You became black. That's what they tagged you as. Their presence created a mixed race culture that diverged from the law's neat racial categories. These Indians' descendants no longer represented a supposedly pure native culture, but many of them retained a communal memory of their roots that would prove invaluable in their later struggles for freedom. So then we continue with making Indians white. This is part one. This is section C. Indians, Africans, and colonial conceptions of race. The concept of race as a fixed biological identity did not exist when Europeans settled in Virginia in the early 17th century. The English of that era perceived the difference primarily as a matter of culture, society, and especially religion. So they weren't classifying you you know, as black, colored, Negro, white, mulatto, any of that. They were just separating the tribes by their their culture, their society, and their religion. They were that's how they were classifying them, right? They they didn't they knew they looked all the same. So they didn't need to be classifying your race. They were just classifying your tribe, what type of people you were and what is was your tribe and your culture and your religion society. This tendency led them to regard Indians and Africans similarly as alien peoples with an odd and unfamiliar culture, and most fundamentally as heathens. Right? What did they what did they tell you in the Papal Vu? 1452 Papal Vu Dumb Diverses? It gave them the right to go enslave all the so-called pagans and heathens, and that included you over here in America. They were plotting. Before they came over here, they knew you were over here and what they were going to do to you. All right, we've already covered this. Their paganism legitimated in English minds the enslavement of both Indians and Africans after their capture in a just war. This principle of the era's Eurocentric law of nations 
undergirdled the transatlantic slave trade and the enslavement of natives captured in Virginia's Indian Wars. Religion proved an unstable justification for slavery because enslaved Indians and Africans could negate English claims to their labor through conversion to Christianity, as they did in increasing numbers in the mid 17th century. So if you accepted Jesus, right, Christianity, you might have the opportunity to be a free person. So, hey, a lot of the ancestors did it. They had no other choice. They didn't want to be slaves. All right. So they had to accept Christianity. Courts occasionally recognized this logic. As in one instance, when an Indian sold into slavery, secured release by citing his desire for baptism, right, he secured his freedom because he's like, I'm going to just let them baptize me. I'm going to say I'm Christian. I don't want to be a slave. Such decisions led masters actively to discourage conversions among their slaves. Concerned by this perverse disincentive to acculturate Africans and Indians, the Virginia Assembly in 1667 decreed that the baptism of slaves does not accept them from bondage. So in 1667, they made sure that even if you accepted Christianity because they wanted you to become a Christian, that you wouldn't get your freedom. They had to make a law for that. All right, you're hearing all this, right? This statute allowed masters to Christianize their slaves without fear, but it also eliminated religion as the bright line distinction between slavery and freedom. The invention of race thus deemed from the practical necessity for a sharp division between slavery and freedom that would endure even as Africans and Indians acculturated through the adoption of English language, culture, and religion. The core of the racial idea, the belief in innit differences grounded in nature, not culture, first developed among the colonists towards the Indians during the frequent wars that plagued 17th century Virginia. Again, this first developed among the colonists towards the Indians, not Africans, Indians. Virginian elites quickly adapted it to support the growing institution of slavery by cultivating racial hostility against the Africans and Indians in their midst. By the 18th century, a host of statues legally enforced the separation between whites of whatever class and the non-whites at the bottom of society, whether slave or free. The survival of Virginia's economy and society came to depend on this case system for a muted class conflict between planters and poor whites by uniting them as part of a common race of masters. At the same time, it is isolated the dangerous mass at the bottom of society behind the supposedly unbridgeable racial divide. The development of race had negative and positive implications for Virginia's natives. Legally, Indians were an undifferentiated part of the racially stigmatized underclass. Some free native descendants persisted on the fringes of Anglo-Virginian society occasionally amassing substantial land, holdings, and achieving economic success. Still, more Indian descendants remained in slavery, the legacy of Bacon's rebellion. But the development of race also made it increasingly difficult for Virginians to argue that Indians and Africans were the same. In everyday encounters, Virginians distinguished between Indians and Africans and tended to view natives more favorably. Free and enslaved natives recognized this growing divide between the law, which continued to homogenize all people of color into a single racial underclass and popular white perceptions, which regarded Indians more positively than Africans. Dodge the hijack with the African. She needs to prove they were coming from Africa. She's just going up the history she was taught. Natives exploited this gap by asserting their Indianness, free descendants of Indians leveraged their identity into successful claims for land and respect. For Indian slaves, the stakes were even higher. They sought to transform the ancestry into freedom. For a long time, they did not succeed. But in the late 18th century, the confluence of numerous factors finally allowed them to prevail. Making Indian white 
the judicial abolition of native slavery and revolutionary Virginia and its racial legacy. And we are in part two now. So it's Robin versus Hardaway, its progeny, and the legal reconceptualization of slavery. Indian freedom suits and racial determination. Slaves could not easily obtain legal freedom in colonial Virginia. The assembly imposed ever increasing restrictions on manumission by the mid 18th century. A master could free his slave only for meritorious service as judged by the colony's governor and his council. Even then, a freed slave had to leave Virginia within six months upon threat of a fine for the owner. Now you hear that? You had to leave. These deterrents made manumission extremely rare in 18th century Virginia, with only a few formal requests in any given decade. So they didn't even do these requests because they didn't even want to leave. Slaves who were freed illegally faced seizure and forced sale by the country court. In 1728, the church wardens of Northampton County petitioned the county court complaining that Tom, an Indian boy slave, has by the last will and testament of Isaac Hageman been pretendedly set free contrary to the act of assembly. Unable to seize the boy on their own, the wardens requested that a constable seize the boy so that he may be disposed of as the law directs. The court granted the petition and Tom was sold. Such stories demonstrate concretely the impetus impediments to manumission even when a master willingly gave up his valuable human property again valuable human property it was an indian boy slave and even if he had his freedom they did other things other policies other laws to make sure he was you know kept as a slave all his life because it says tom was sold right one legal avenue to liberty did remain open, however, the freedom suit. From the beginnings of slavery in Virginia in the 17th century, slaves could sue their masters in court and claim that their enslavement was unlawful. Did you know that? Did you know slaves in the 1600s can sue their masters and eventually sometimes win their freedom? Did you know that? That's not what they teach us in history. If they were successful, they received their freedom. And often damages as well. And often damages as well. So how do you gain your freedom? And all of a sudden have acres of land and money. Well, now you know. Compared with the strict requirements for manumission. These provisions seem generous. But they reinforce the slave system. They bolstered the notion that slavery rested on the rule of law. Dividing slave from free and black from white. In a strict legal sense, freedom suits were not about race. Since 1662, Virginia law had provided that slavery descended matrilineally, and therefore the dispositive issue was whether the petitioner's mother had been a slave. But in society with a few free Africans, the legal status of the mother almost always turned on her race. The vast majority of freedom petitions therefore claimed that descent from a white woman made the petitioner's slavery illegal. Resolving these cases were relatively simple. Since by law, whites could not be slaves, courts would sub poena knowledge, knowledgeable locals. In 1732, for instance, Nanny Bandy proved that she was the mulatto child of a white woman. Deciding she had been leg illegally detained in slavery, the court freed her children upon her petition the following year. However, even a favorable verdict did not guarantee manumission. Now, we got to be very careful, right? Because we already saw in the past video that a lot of the Native American uh, or American Native uh, peoples were being classified as white, right? Just like we heard in the other video that his mom was being classified as white. And we already know about mulatto. So was that, was that really a white person? And was she really a mulatto? You know, think about that. However... Even a favorable verdict did not guarantee manumission. The ambiguous line between black and white, slave and servant, meant that individ individuals legally entitled to their freedom often faced years of forced labor for masters who routinely disregarded indentured agreements and judicial decrees. All right, so you hear that? Keeping you in chattel slavery 
well aware that the legal apparatus of society would rarely intervene to protect the rights of racial inferiors. Enslaved Indians also sued for their freedom, although they rarely alleged white parentage. Instead, they claimed as Indian Will did in his 1747 petition for freedom that the laws of your country is entirely against freeborn Indians to be made slaves. Such an argument begs the question for given the ambiguity between Indian slavery and servitude that had existed in previous generations. Determining who was freeborn was not straightforward. Given the commonality of racial mixing, appearance provided no solution, and documentation clarifying the legal status of a slave's mother was rare. To solve this dilemma, the courts turned to communal memory. In the case of Anne Williams Indian, for instance, the court dispatched Michael and William Christian to investigate Anne's claims to freedom. The Christians deposed almost 20 white community members about Anne's mother Jane. All the witnesses reiterated the same two points. They all took the SD wench Jane to be an Indian, but they knew nothing of her being free and stated that she lived a slave and died as such as far as they knew. Faced with the Christian's report, the court concluded that Anne had no right to her freedom. So you hear that, right? So people said, yeah, we knew she was an Indian. They're talking about her mom, right? We knew she was an Indian, but she was also a slave. She was born a slave and died a slave. So the court was like, well, your mom was a slave. Even though she was an Indian, then you're going to be a slave too. This outcome was not universal, as some Indians did successfully win their freedom in court. But the court's reliance on the opinion of white community as proof set the odds against the Indians. Of course that would happen. As Indian Will argued in his petition, his mother was very well known to be a free Indian by several white inhabitants now dwelling in this country. But they had kept silent, not caring to curry ill will of their neighbor. In such instances, there was little reason besides honesty for whites to support Indian claims, but there was powerful incentive to oppose them. Powerful. They'd rather lie. They'd rather lie in these court cases. That's what was going on. Indentured white servants were being given their freedom of after their indentured servitude was completed, their contract or the judicial decree was completed. On the other hand, American Indians was not given the same um, rights they were not fulfilling your contract they were keeping you as a servant slash slave and eventually it be, did become chattel slavery what we know of slavery but it didn't start out like that this is what i'm trying to show you Race played different roles in these Indian freedom suits, and the more frequent cases alleged white ancestry. For slaves who claimed descent from whites, the presumption of freedom for Europeans made the race of the mother dispositive. These lawsuits thus hinged on determining the race of both the mother and the plaintiff. In pre-evolutionary Virginia, however, Indians could be slave or free. As in the case of Anne Williams, merely pro proven descent from an Indian carried no presumption of freedom. It was also necessary to establish the mother's free status, a tricky proposition when few documents existed. You hear this? And their treatment of Indian laborers often amounted to slavery, whatever their formal legal status. Indian identity, in other words, continued to have an ambiguous legal meaning. Certainly, natives were lumped with other people of color and therefore labored on, under significant legal disability. But in the fundamental division between slave and free that structured Virginian society, Indianness was neither an inherent badge of slavery, like blackness, nor a badge of freedom. Again, just because you were of a dark skin, right, or black, or because you were Indian, this basically did not inherit you or the tag of a slave, right? or freedom, so it wasn't the rule. Like whiteness, it was its own racial class, and it forced the courts to deal in particularities of status rather than race-based generalizations. B, 
Robin vs. Hardaway, the beginning of the end. Robin vs. Hardaway was yet another Indian freedom suit. Unlike earlier cases though, the suit challenged the legality of Indian slavery itself rather than litigating the plaintiff's particular circumstances. The resulting decision heralded a watershed in the legal connection between race and slavery as it began the process of judicially abolishing Indian slavery. There were 12 plaintiffs in Robin, all slaves in Dinwiddle County, who claimed trespass, assault, battery, and false imprisonment against their owners for their illegal detention and slavery. All were descended from Indian women. All were Indians. You hear this, right? All these plaintiffs were Indians. But they were, what? In a slave plantation. Who was supposed to be in the slave plantation? You, right? So-called Negro. But these were Indians who were fighting for their freedom in court. All right? All were descended from Indian women. A fact that went unchallenged at trial. The sole legal issue was the validity of the 1682 statute that provided for Indian enslavement. The question the lawyers addressed, therefore, was when the act was repealed and whether it it ever was. The statutory claims. Number one, George Mason argued on behalf of the plaintiffs that the Virginia Assembly had repealed the 1682 statute on three separate occasions, in 1684, 1691, and 1705. Since his clients descended from Indians enslaved after 1705, they were legally entitled to freedom under any of these statutes. Mason's arguments demonstrated subtle lawyering. He argued, for instance, that the reference to servants in the 1682 law could not apply to Indians, since it is notorious there is no such thing as servitude known among any of the Indian tribes. The only Indian slaves the legislature could have meant were those enslaved during Bacon's Rebellion, and since the Assembly had repealed all the laws enacted during Bacon's Rebellion in 1684, no Indians could have been enslaved after that time. You hear that? But they were still doing it. In case this logic did not persuade, Mason pointed to two other laws that repealed the 1682 Act. He insisted that an Act of 1691 that allowed free trade with Indians also implied that the 1682 law had been repealed. After all, he suggested how could Indians repeatedly trade if they were subject to enslavement. Such an imputation would do indignity to any legislation. Finally, Mason pointed to the provision of the 1705 Virginian Slave Code that proclaimed that all non-Christian servants shall be accounted slaves. Again, Mason insisted Indians were not servants when they were imported, and since this law supplanted all earlier legislation, on the subject, it repealed in 1682 law. Under the new law, Indians could no longer be servants or slaves. Again, key thing he mentioned here, imported. So Indians being imported, I thought it was Africans. All right. Colonel Richard Blant, the prominent Virginia lawyer, representing the owner, attacked Mason's liberties with the statutory history. He noted that Indian and African slavery predated the 1682 law, and he demonstrated that the law was primarily intended to repeal the glaring absurdity of the 1670s law's distinction between servants who arrived by land and those who came by sea. He also castigated Mason's interpretation of 1691 Act, ensuring free trade, which conflated laws relative to slavery with those relative to trade. Finally. Bland compared the 1682 and the 1705 laws side by side and demonstrated that the language was nearly identical, suggesting that the legislature intended to reinforce, not repeal, the 1682 law. Bland's arguments were legally and historically stronger. Mason's claims that servitude did not exist among Indians directly contradicted the Assembly's understanding when it enacted the 1682 law. Mason's readings of the 1691 and 1705 acts were similarly mistaken. The Assembly probably did not intend the 1691 Act to end Indian slavery, since the Burgesses drew a sharp distinction between friendly and hostile Indians. As for the legislature that drafted the 1705 law defining slavery, it primarily had imported African slaves in mind, since the transatlantic slave trade was the colony's most vital source of labor, dodged the hijack. But numerous other provisions of the slave code imposed disabilities on both Africans and Indians. Most problematic for Mason's argument, though, was historical practice 
Virginian officials continued to speak of and treat enslaved Indians as slaves even after the 1705 law. Mason's view invented a dramatic legal change that no one at the time observed or obeyed. Thus, Mason's history bore little resemblance to the actual evolution of Indian slavery in Virginia. This gap underscores the social transformation that had occurred in the colony since the beginning of the 18th century. Indian slavery had become so invisible that Mason confidently argued that the institution had been outlawed three quarters of a century earlier. Making Indians White Part 2, Number 2, The Natural Law Claims Mason's most radical arguments rested on a natural law, not the Assembly's enactment. He asserted that the 1682 law legitimizing the enslavement of Indians violated God's law and was therefore invalid since all acts of legislature apparently contrary to natural right and justice are void. This claim rested on the belief that positive law was subordinate to a more fundamental natural law. A widespread enlightenment belief that gained particular salience in America with the pre-evolutionary protests against British authority. As Mason argued, the law of nature are the laws of God, whose authority can be superseded by no power on earth. Mason described the settlement of America as an unwarranted invasion as the colonists by force disposed the Indians of the wilds they had inhabited from the creation of the world. Those Indians who acknowledged European authority did so through sol solemn treaties that preserved their freedom, not through the servile submission of individuals to individuals. This certainly precluded enslavement, as no instance can be produced where even heathens have imposed slavery on a free people, in peace with them. As for hostile Indians, Masons rejected the standard just war, argument legitimating the enslavement of captives. Regardless of who commenced the hostilities, it was the Indians, he emphasized, who were fighting just wars, since they were defending their lands against outside invaders. In a final re rhetorical flourish, Mason explicitly linked these debates over Indian slavery with the colonists' struggles against British assertions of sovereignty. And it says here, the Indians of every denomination, example, friendly and hostile, were free and independent of us. They were not subject to our empire, not represented in our legislature. They derived no protection from our laws, nor could be subjected to their bonds. If natural right, independence, defect of representation and this uh, vowel of protection are not sufficient to keep them from the coercion of our laws. On what other principles can we justify our opposition to some late acts of power exercised over us by the British legislature? Yet they only pretended to impose on us a paltry tax and money. We on our free neighbors, the joke of perpetual slavery. Mason does argue that Indian slavery violated natural laws, limits on sovereignty. Such arguments were hazardous, for their logic threatened to undetermine a society predicated on inequality and forced labor. In rebuttal, Colonel Bland disputed the premise that a court could simply disregard a law that it believed violated natural law. Nonetheless, he argued Indian slavery did not violate natural law. Echoing slavery's later apologist, Bland relied on biblical and English history to demonstrate that natural law encompasses both hierarchy and slavery. In particular, he addressed the much more economically important institution of African slavery, Dash the Hijack. But in proper perspective, Bland suggested the laws enslaving Indians were much less unjust than the laws making slaves of Negroes, inhabitants of Africa. After all, the Indians had constantly attacked the English, and so the Virginians had enslaved the natives based on the principles of self defense. You hear what he was using as an argument? By contrast, the Africans in Africa could never endure our properties or disturb our peace. Huh. Yet there is no objection made to the validity of the Negro laws on account of their injustice. Bland called forth the, the specter of African slavery that loomed over all arguments over freedom in natural law and Revolutionary War era Virginia. Confronted with Bland's rebuttal, Mason's task mirrored the larger challenge that confronted all Virginia's would-be revolutionaries, explaining why some people deserve to be naturally free, white colonists and Indians, while others deserve perpetual servitude. 
Masons conceded his argument implications for African slavery, but he insisted that it was less unjust than the enslavement of Indians. For the Africans are absolute slaves in their own country, he claimed, none but the king being a free man there. African slavery only continued a slavery which existed before, whereas to the Indians, the slavery is created by the axe. Mason thus attempted to rehabilitate his natural law argument through an appeal to his error's distinction between naturally free natives and naturally depraved Africans. Slavery was fit for one, he implied, but not the other, and therefore his listeners should not hear in his words a coded argument for abolition. Mason's natural law claims threatened to nullify statutes wherever a lawyer could compelling argue for the fundamental law. They also dangerously exposed the capriciousness of slavery and its weak justification. The radicalism inherited in the revolutionary moment and the need for the colony slaveholders to contain it acquired urgency in this argument over Indian slavery. Number three, the outcome and the puzzle. We're talking about the case, right? Robin versus Hardaway. The court's decision has survived as a single line. The court had judged that neither of the Acts 1684 or 1691 repealed that of 1682, but that it was repealed by the Act of 1705. The court declared that plaintiffs free and not slaves, and ordered that the defendants pay their costs as well as one shilling in damages. Their freedom won, the various plaintiffs thereafter vanished from the historical record. They, These free people who won a court case vanished from your textbooks, basically. Their brief encounter with momentous legal debates over. The decision itself left a greater legacy. Indian freedom suits no longer turned solely on the mother status. Instead, except for a brief 23-year window between 1682 and 1705, when sanctioned by law, Indian slavery was presumptively illegal in Virginia. Indian racial identity itself, like whiteness and unlike blackness, now offered a possible route to freedom. The decision also left a puzzle. With no written opinion, the court gave no explanation for its rejection of Bland's well-reasoned arguments in favor of Mason's convoluted ones. And since later opinions simply accepted Robin's conclusion that the 1705 Act ended legal slavery for Indians, no satisfying account was ever provided. On their dramatic redefinition of Indians' status, the Virginian courts remained silent. See Robin's progeny. The decision in Robin did not immediately abolish Indian slavery. First, no published account of Robin existed until 1829, so its direct legal influence was limited. Moreover, the case merely substantiated a new test for freedom. Whether a slave's Indian ancestor had been enslaved before 1705, or the older determination through reputation evidence of the legal status of the slave's mother, this new test was not necessarily more favorable to the descendants of enslaved natives because most Indian slaves in Virginia had been enslaved prior to 1705 and later enslavement was difficult to prove. This reality quickly became apparent. After Robin, many slaves flocked to the courts to bring their suits. In October 1772, Paul Michaux advertised for Jim, a runaway slave who pretends to have a right to his freedom by virtue of his half Indian descent. So remember we went over the uh, runaway slave ads, right? Here's another one where the guy is saying, hey, be careful. This guy is saying he's free, but he's not free. But this guy was really free and that's why he ran away. He was an American Indian. He knew he wasn't supposed to be enslaved. When he went away, Mishaks wrote, I expect that he was gone to the general court to seek for his freedom. Less than a year later, David, allegedly of the Indian breed, Again, remember this, of the Indian breed, we got this in the runaway ads, also supposedly ran down to the general court to sue for his freedom. If they made it to court, these two slaves and many others were likely deeply disappointed. In June 1772, the court confronted a multitude of cases filed by the descendants of Indian slaves, but reiterated its verdict from Robin that the 1682 law remained in effect until 1705 and thus gave judgment against many descendants of Indians introduced and held as slaves between 1682 and 1705. The court unwillingly to interpret Robin as a blanket prohibition against Indian slavery maintained his narrow interpretation. Virginia's highest court 
recast as the Supreme Court of Appeals in the post-revolutionary reforms of Virginia's judiciary, finally revisited the legality of Indian slavery in 1787. In Hannah v. Davis, John Marshall, James Monroe, and others represented plaintiffs claiming descent from Bess, who a jury had determined was an Indian imported after 1705. Imported. Imported from where? The president of Robin had seemingly been forgotten since Hannah relitigated the same legal question. When was the 1682 law allowing Indian slavery repealed? With nearly the same arguments, plaintiffs' counsel echoed Mason's statutory claims asserting that the 1682 act was null and void since it violated the law of God and the law of nature to make slaves of the Indians. The defendant's counsel countered that the argument against slavery applies equally to African as to Indian nations and insisted that if the burden of proof were placed on the slaveholder, it must be attended with almost universal emancipation. The result in the case was the same as in Robin. The court unanimously ruled that the 1682 Act was absolutely re repealed in 1705. Hannah's duplication of Robin still did not resolve the legality of Indian slavery, for like Robin, the case went unreported. Only five years after Hannah, another enslaved plaintiff faced the Supreme Court of Appeals in the case of Jenkins v. Tom. Tom and other Northumberland County slaves introduced the affidavits of Antian's people to prove descent from two women who were called Indians and had tawny complexions. Again, tawny, with long straight black hair. When they allegedly arrived in Virginia in 1705, arrived from where? When the defendant attempted to argue that, the, that Indian slavery was legal before 1705, the judge intervened and instructed the counsel that he had misstated the law. There had indeed been a law that permitted Indian enslavement at some period in the last century, but it was some time after repealed from which period no American Indian could be sold as slave. All the Indians enslaved after that point who had sued for freedom, he informed the council had uniformly recovered it. The lawyer, upset that this exchange had biased the jury, appealed and lost. The Supreme Court of Virginia affirmed without elaboration. What then was the law on Indian slavery? The general framework of Robin survived Indian slavery was legal at some period, illegal sometimes after. But the details upon which the hopes of so many slaves rested remained vague and thus invited further litigation. The court did not have to wait long. The following year, it heard a similar case in which slaves had been declared free after the jury found that they were maternally descended from Judith, an Indian brought to Virginia. Brought from where? Sometime after the year 1705. The appellant denied that the 1705 law outlawed Indian slavery but lost. The appellee's counsel also failed though for he could not convince the judges to adopt his sweeping assertion that when we speak of an Indian, unqualified by circumstances of any sort, we certainly speak of a free man, and if an Englishman had been mentioned, the court instead introduced an odd new distinction between American Indians who could no longer be enslaved after 1705 and foreign Indians. Unable to decide whether Judith came by land or by sea, the evenly divided court affirmed. This lack of consensus revealed the ongoing confusion over the legal status of the descendants of enslaved natives. Yet amid the impressive distinctions and arbitrary dates, slaves exploited their Indian identity to achieve freedom. Despite doctrinal ambiguity, the plaintiffs in these cases all prevailed and secured their freedom. All! All these plaintiffs who were considered Negro slaves were actually Indians and they were all successful in securing their freedom. Did you know that? Did you know so-called Negro slaves can sue for their freedom? Did you know that? Clarity finally came more than a decade later in a pair of cases that established the precise date after which enslavement of Indians was no longer legal and that made explicit and long Latin presumption in favor of Indian freedom. The first issue was resolved in Palace versus Hill, the freedom suit of numerous descendants of an American Indian named Bess. 
brought to Virginia in 1703. Again, brought from where? By this point, there was little doubt that Indian enslavement was illegal after 1705. When the appealed attempted to controvert what he regarded as this erroneous doctrine, the court refused permission, noting that the principle settled so long ago by the general court was the law of the land confirmed by successive adjudications. But since Bess was enslaved in 1703, this pronouncement was not this positive. The real issue in the case was a new discovery. St. George Tucker had found an identical manuscript copy of the 1705 law enacted in 1691. The judges convinced of the law's authenticity declared that henceforth no Native American Indian brought into Virginia since the year 1691 could under any circumstances be lawfully made a slave. The plaintiffs received a new trial that would undoubtedly find them free and the window for the lawful enslavement of natives shrank to a mere dozen years over a century earlier. The long and chaotic debate over the statutes of defining Indian slavery ended at last. Yet Hudgens versus Wrights decided two years earlier was the more important case in which a straightforward question over the burden of proof re reconfigured the legal meaning of Indian identity in Virginia. The slaves and Hutchkins, about to be sold away from Virginia, quickly filed a freedom suit in the High Court of Chancery, claiming descent from an Indian named Butterwood Nan. Chancellor George Whitty declared the plaintiffs wrongly enslaved and on the ground that freedom is the birthright of every human being, which sentiment is strongly inculcated by the first article of our Bill of Rights also placed the burden of proof in all freedom suits on the defendant. On appeal, the Supreme Court of Appeals introduced a racial distinction into Wheat's sweeping holding. This counsel for the appeals observed was not a common case for mere blacks suing for their freedom, but of persons perfectly white. Since according to the court, all white persons are and ever been free in this country. When one evidently white be notwithstanding claimed as a slave, the proof lies on the party claiming to make the other his slave. American Indians too. The court declared without the hesitation one might expect after such a long and tortured history of conflicting case law, where prima facie free. The court thus approved which reasoning so far as the same relates to white persons and Native American Indians but refused to extend his evidentiary principle to Native Africans and their descendants, dodged the hijack. The court recognized that these presumptions of status posed a significant challenge in application, since they traced the threshold issue of racial determination, which was often dispositive of freedom suits. But Judge Tucker, for one, believed that this difficulty could be resolved through common sense racial stereotyping the distinction between the natives of Africa and the aborigines of America. Was so pointed, he wrote, that a man might as easily mistake the glossy, jetty clothing of an American bear for the wool of a black sheep, as the hair of an American Indian for that of an African, or the descendant of an African. Such evidence affected which party bore the burden of proof, but it could also prove this positive on its own. In Hudgens itself, for instance, the long straight black hair of Butterwood Nan's daughter helped establish her Indian identity. You hear that? Such crude stereotypes have prompted considerable scholarly attention, but most freedom suits had long depended on the perception of the racial identity of the plaintiff, albeit rarely so explicitly. The absence of written documentation and the widespread use of reputation evidence meant that popular understanding of race based on primarily on physical appearance inevitably determined such cases, particularly when the slaves in question claimed descent from whites. This had not been true for the descendants of Indians, however, whose statues in the colonial era depended on their mothers legal status, or even after Robin hinged on the date of their ancestors' enslavement. What was new in Tucker's opinion, therefore, was the suggestion that Indian identity alone made the plaintiffs prima facie 
free. Unconcerned with the dates and statues that so preoccupied prior courts, Tucker did not dwell into the complicated history of Butterwood's Nance importation. Importation from where? It was enough for him that the plaintiffs looked the path, the part. As the court ruling made it clear, blackness remained both the legal and popular badge of slavery. So blackness was synonymous with slavery, while Indians would henceforth join whites in presumptive freedom. Hudgens ended the long and complicated road that began with Robin. Hutchins was not the last Indian freedom suit. On at least two more occasions before the Civil War, the Supreme Court of Appeals clarified the legal framework it had elaborated. But these cases turned on whether the slaves in question were actually Indians. In the fundamental divide between slave and free, black and white, that characterized antebellum Virginia society, Indians now enjoyed the liberty that had previously been the sole privilege of whiteness. The incremental nature of this legal transformation obscured its radicalism. Each decision expanded the prohibition against Indian slavery only slightly, yet the cumulative effect was dramatic and sweeping. In the space of a generation, the Virginia courts eliminated an institution that had been widely accepted from the earliest settlement and that had existed without legal challenge for over a century. Indian identity became gradually a path to freedom. Half a surly, Virginia's highest court had judicially abolished Indian slavery. This abolition contrasted sharply with Virginia courts in action on African slavery. African slavery was obviously a far more economical and socially important institution than Indian servitude, but its existence raised even deeper anxieties among its practitioners. Virginia's elite realized that all perpetual bondage whether of Indians or Africans, conflicted with the principles of natural law. Yet Virginia's courts and legislature made only a few half-hearted efforts to ameliorate African slavery or American Indian slavery. Even as they boldly abolished the enslavement of Indians, this contrast raises the question, why did the abolition of Indian slavery occur at all? Making Indians white the judicial abolition of native slavery in revolutionary Virginia and its racial legacy. This is part three of this article, Why Indians Could No Longer Be Slaves. The reason Virginia's courts abolished Indian slavery is less evident than it seems. This part evaluates several possible explanations, including statutory interpretation, the influence of the American Revolution, and changing racial perceptions. It ultimately concludes that the abolition of Indian slavery occurred because it strengthened the institution of slavery in Virginia rather than weakening it. So it made it worth what they're trying to say. And did you even know there was an Indian uh, uh, abolition? Did you even know there was an Indian abolition? Not African-American slavery abolition. Indian abolition. There was. One threshold issue should be addressed and discarded. Indian slavery was economically marginal by the time of the American Revolution. This development contrasted sharply with the African slave population, which nearly doubled in size between 1775 and 1800, dodged the hijack. Freedom for the descendants of Indians was thus certainly less costly than loosening African bondage. Finding for the plaintiff in a freedom suit, however, was not costly. Dozens of current slaves might be set free upon the determination that a single ancestor was wrongly enslaved, and masters received no compensation for their lost property. Indian emancipation had fewer social consequences than freeing African slaves, but not none. The court granting Indian freedom were still consciously choosing to violate property rights on another normative basis. The rest of this part seeks to unearth that basis says part a statutory interpretation the most straightforward explanation of why virginia courts freed indian slaves is the one the court courts gave they interpreted and applied the laws that the assembly had enacted the assembly authorized indian servitude in 1679 and again in 1682 but it repealed those laws in 1705 
as originally thought, or in 1691, as the evolution of the court's knowledge suggested. Indian slaves were wrongfully held if they could prove descent from an ancestor enslaved after those dates. They deserved to go free as a matter of law. The line of cases from Robin to Hudgens reflected judges obeying their mandate to enforce the law while perfecting their understanding of the statutory history. This account has much to recommend it, although the court's simplified story obscured a more complicated history. Part of the function of the courts is to bring order to chaos, even at the risk of distorting past realities. There is also a danger in the arrogance of insight. A present-day reader cannot help but regard the decision in Robin on the strict facts as baffling. But a historical and cultural goal separates us from the deciding judges. So hear what he said. They are very important. He says that a present-day reader, you, us, right now, reading this, learning about this case, right? Robin and Hardaway, how an Indian or so-called Negro slave that was actually an Indian was able to sue for his freedom. He's saying how the present-day reader cannot help but regard the decision in Robin on the strict facts as baffling. This is so baffling to us. They never taught us this stuff in history. But a historical and cultural gulf separates us from the deciding judges, who were not limited to the details that have survived in the archives. Conservatively, the modern-day chronicler can assemble resources unavailable to the actors themselves. You hear that? All right, so us here, right? Today, modern-day chroniclers, right? We can assemble sources that were unavailable to the actors themselves of the people because they didn't know, they didn't have a lot of knowledge that we have right now. The participants were unaware of now of obvious legal points. Finally, there's no evidence that the judges were insincere in their professions of fidelity to the law. To interpret their opinions as masking their real motivations suggests either deep cynicism or great presumption on the part of the historian. Yet even while we credit the judges beliefs that they simply enforce the law, we must acknowledge that this explanation does not satisfactorily account for the legal shift. Even relatively straightforward statutes may admit multiple interpretations, so judges must evaluate them based on conformity to some outside or higher principle. In Indian freedom suits, there are particularly salient reasons to question whether statutes alone dictated the court's decisions. The statutory history was conflicted with little clear evidence of legislative intent and a strong argument based on plain language supporting Indian slavery. Even more compelling was practice. Indian slavery persisted in Virginia, both de facto and de jure, long after the assembly passed the 1705 or 1691 act that abolished it. Until Robin, no court had held that Indian slavery itself was no longer legal after 1705 or any other point in Virginian history. Robin and his progeny overturned more than a century of legal precedent and accepted practice on the strength of a single statute that had existed for 70 years. The statute may have been a necessary precondition, but it alone is hardly sufficient to explain such a dramatic change in doctrine. To explain the judicial abolition of Indian slavery adequately, we must move beyond the accounts the judges themselves preferred. While not incorrect, their opinions constrained by the conventions of the common law created an artificially autonomous realm of law, in parentheses, divorced from social and political considerations. Yet law, particularly the highly charged law of race and slavery, never existed in such a vacuum. Here the passage of time benefits us for it allows us to appreciate the confluence of societal and legal trends that judges did not acknowledge at the time. Two important influences in society, the American Revolution and the shift in racial perceptions, were crucial to the judicial abolition of Indian slavery. Making Indians White, Part 3, Section B. Slavery and the Revolutionary Moment. In contrast to the romanticized conception of a serene, Founding the last quarter of the 18th century, the era of Robin and the subsequent decisions was one of the most tumultuous and unstable periods of American history. As the leveling and emancipatory rhetoric of the American Revolution challenged long-standing institutions, 
Slavery in particular became the focus of considerable debate as, as its blatant contradiction of the declared principles of liberty struck many observers. As newly minted Americans attempted to create new polities, or I believe policies, modeled on Republican principles, they wrestled with methods to eliminate the institution from their midst. One of the most important methods of challenging slavery was judicial. Slavery in the English colonies was born of expediency, not legal tradition. It was not legal. For nearly two centuries, the Anglo-American law of slavery consisted of a hodgepodge of custom local statute and antiquated philosophizing used to justify pre-existing facts on the ground, while control of slaves' daily lives rested in the private government of the plantation. In the late 18th century, however, courts throughout the Anglo-American world began to challenge the haphazard justifications invoked to support chattel slavery and issued a number of opinions with profound emancipatory implications. In 1772, at nearly the same moment when Robin brought suit in the general court, another Virginian slave, James Somerset, also sought his freedom in English court. Somerset's master had taken Somerset to England, where he had attempted to run away. After his recapture, his master passed him to a ship's captain for sale in Jamaica, but Somerset secured a writ of habeas corpus with the help of several abolitionists. The resulting case, Somerset v. Stewart, marked a watershed in English legal history. Lord Mansfield, the most eminent English jurist of the era, held that Somerset, while lawfully enslaved in Virginia, was not a slave in England. The state of slavery is of such nature, he reasoned, that it is incapable of being introduced on any reasons, moral or political. Slavery, so odious that nothing can be suffered to support it but positive law. Concluding that no such enabling law existed in England, Mansfield ordered that the black must be discharged. The black. There are a number of striking similarities between Somerset and Robin Beyond their near simultaneity, both cases included extended natural law discussions of the justice of slavery. In both in instances, the court also sought to clarify an ambiguous and unsettled legal history through oversimplification. Finally, both courts delivered narrow legal opinions largely limited to the facts of the cases. Manfield interpreted his decision as applying only when a master sought to transport a slave out of the country. But subsequent opinions as well as popular perceptions soon gave Somerset, like Robin, a much broader reach. The case achieved canonical status as the decision that abolished slavery in England. You hear that? This exaggeration occurred in large part because those most affected by the decision, slaves themselves, insisted on this interpretation invoking the cases to justify their claims to freedom. The decision in Somerset became known almost immediately in America, where it reinforced the emancipatory rhetoric of the revolution. So you hear this, again, 1772, right? Before the Revolutionary War in America. So this had an influence. This American Indian, Aboriginal, going to England, you know, illegally taken probably and, and forced to be a slave over there. And he fought for it. He was like, nah, man, I'm not a slave. He knew who he was, right? We're, they, they're telling us here that he was legally bought as a slave. We don't know if he was an Indian, but we do know that Indians were illegally being sold as slaves. So, okay, which one is it, right? This influenced the American, uh, the rhetoric of the revolution. You hear that? This is before 1776. So, all right, just like we know Crispus Attuck, first martyr, throughout the colonies, slavery's legal status was under attack. At Harvard's 1773 commencement, students debated whether slavery was illegal because it violated natural law. Somerset and the American Revolution also inspired slaves in Massachusetts to initiate a number of freedom suits that almost always resulted in the plaintiff's liberty. In 1783, a complicated legal battle involving Polk Walker, an enslaved African, confronted the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. 
Chief Justice William Cushion charged the jury that whatever usages formally prevailed or slid in upon us by the example of others on the subject, the advent of the glorious struggle of our rights had enshrined intimates for favorable to the natural rights of mankind without regard to complexion in the Massachusetts Constitution. All right. So we really got to study if this guy was really African because I get I come across a lot of this stuff. And when I really go search into the historical accounts of those times, they're not saying anything about person being African. They just call him a mulatto or Negro, a person who has a dark complexion. Continuing, it says, Cushion therefore concluded, slavery is in my judgment as effectively abolished as it can be by the granting of rights and privileges, wholly incompatible and repugnant to its existence. As in Robin and Somerset, the sweeping rhetoric believed narrow and ambiguous holding whose emancipatory potential was limited because the unreported case that survived was half forgotten. But while historians debate whether the case abolished slavery as a matter of law, Contemporary popular understanding credited it as a mortal wound to slavery in Massachusetts, which became the only state in the 1790 census with no slaves. Massachusetts was not the only state that abolished slavery after the revolution. Above the Mason-Dixon line, where slavery was ingrained but less economically vital, every state adopted some form of abolition. Unlike Massachusetts, however, other states adopted legislative plans that ensued radicalism in favor of gradual emancipation. Pennsylvania, for instance, enacted the law abolishing slavery in 1780, but full emancipation did not occur until 1847. On the national level, the drafting of the new constitution quickly implicated slavery. Despite the efforts of anti-slavery Northerners, the resulting document allowed Southerners to invoke federal power to protect their slave property. The drafters euphemistically referred to slaves as other persons. You hear that? That's very important in the census records. Other persons. Or as persons held to service or labor. Providing further evidence of deep discomfort, many of them felt. All right, so that's indentured service. In Virginia, where slavery was the center of the economy, the debate was particularly fierce. Virginians were all were well aware of the growing hostility towards slavery throughout the Anglo-American world, and especially in the courts. News for the, of the Somerset Death's decision arrived in the colony in April 1772. The month Robin was decided, several months later, Virginia newspapers published a full transcript of Manfield's opinion. Anglo-Virginians complained that the case led their slaves to imagine they will be free in Britain, a notion now too prevalent among the Negroes, greatly to the vexation and prejudice of their masters. In 1795, Virginian anti-slavery judge and treaties writer St. George Tucker dispatched a series of queries to Massachusetts regarding how the state had wholly exterminated slavery. The open letter he received in response stressed the role of the judicial courts, including the Quark Walker case, in abolishing the institution. At the same time that well-heeled Virginians learned that elite opinion in the North and in Britain was turning against slavery, internal events of the Revolutionary War gave a new urgency to these doubts. The colony's royal governor issued a wartime proclamation offering liberty to any slaves who fought for the British, an act that led thousands of slaves to flee British lines and caused alarm among Virginian planters. Motivated by the combination of fear and genuine desire to reform, the Virginia elite sought to ameliorate slavery in the war's aftermath. In 1778, the legislature abolished the slave trade in an effort to slow the institution's growth in the state. It went on one step further in 1782, when it liberalized the restrictive laws on manumission and allowed owners to free slaves without restriction as long as the slaves were of sound mind and of the right age to support themselves. Scholars debate the extent to which this law undermined slavery, but it produced a dramatic upsurge in Virginia's free black 
population. You hear that? Free black population. Then we're just talking about you. Behind such measures lay the hope of Virginia's liberal reformers that the new restrictions might lead to slavery. Slavery slowed death. Nearly all Virginia's po political elite shared the growing distaste for bondage. Manifest in the era's intellectual culture, they excoriated slavery for the injustice it did to the slave, as well as for what they regarded as its deleterious effect on white morals. Their racist ideology and disdain for Africans, however, made them deeply anxious about the presence of free blacks and the potential for racial mixing. Now you hear what's going on. Caught in this dilemma, they pinned vague and abstract plans for slavery to disappear through the power of demographics, even as the state's slave population increased. On a more concrete level, though, they maintained the racial boundaries that kept most blacks enslaved and the few free blacks marginalized and heavily regulated. In 1806, for instance, the legislature added a proviso to the liberal provisions for manumission enacted in 1782. Freed slaves now had to leave the state with, within 12 months, or their masters would have to pay a fine. All right, so they didn't want all these free so-called Indians, so-called Negroes uh, around them. They didn't want, you know, in case of any, uh, you know, uprising or whatever, right? You, you would decide to take your land back, right? They didn't want you to go that far. So they would make you leave. It would make your ancestors leave after they were freed, supposedly free, right? A lot of them um, were never supposed to be slaves. Freedom was desirable only as long as the Virginians did not have to live with their former slaves. This ambivalent commitment to freedom did little to undermine slavery in Virginia. Rather than dying a slow death, the institution remained crucial to the state's economy and society. If anything, the reform measures reconciled slave owners' humanitarian aspirations with the reality of slaveholding. What had been widely regarded as a pernicious but necessary evil was reconceded as a form of benevolent paternalism. Indeed, with the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade in 1808, Virginia became vital to the plantation complex of the entire South, as nearly 100,000 slaves were exported from the Chesapeake to the new plantations in Kentucky, Tennessee, and the lower Mississippi, by the early 19th century, the revolutionary moment and the doubts it occasioned about slavery had largely passed. Many of these well-intentioned men, whose efforts to end slavery in Virginia proved ineffectual, were members of Virginia's legal elite, part of the state's growing class of college-educated professional lawyers. These men enjoyed national prominence and an influence among them were some of the foremost political leaders and legal scholars of the early republic. Many also played key roles in the Indian freedom suits. George Mason argued Indian slavery violated natural law. Thomas Jefferson recorded Robin v. Hardaway and once represented a supposedly white plaintiff in a freedom suit himself. Supposedly white, you hear that? Supposedly white in parentheses. John Marshall successfully represented plaintiffs claiming Indian descent in Hannah v. Davis and Coleman v. Dick and Pat. George Whitney as chancellor presided over the first trial of Hutchins v. Wrights, and St. George Tucker penned the Supreme Court opinions in Pallas and Hutchins. Indian slavery, like African slavery, laid bare to Virginia's legal elite, the dissonance between their ideals and their practice. They connected their judicial abolition of Indian slavery with the revolutionary rhetoric of freedom and the efforts to eliminate African slavery gradually. George Mason's arguments and Robin noted that the same principles that justified the opposition to some late acts of power by the British also rejected the power to enslave Indians, who, like the colonists, were naturally free and independent, lacked representation, and existed outside the jurisdiction of the legislature. He also caught the irony that occurred when colonists claimed that they had been enslaved by parliaments in position of a paltry tax and money. Even as they inflicted the actual joke of perpetual slavery, on their free neighbors, perpetual slavery, because it was supposed to be servitude only with a contract. George Whitney in turn used Mason's revolution-inspired Virginian Declaration of Rights to declare a presumption of freedom for all plaintiffs in freedom suits. 
Indian slavery, like African slavery, was therefore part of the larger issue of the persistence of bondage in a society that proclaimed itself free. In cases involving Indian slavery, however, Virginian lawyers and judges could act on their higher principles with relatively few consequences. Given the economic marginality of Indian slavery, there was no slippery slope, no deep anxiety that freedom for natives might undo. African slavery, the state's most vital economic institution, since slaves who wished to bring freedom suits still face high hurdles. The difficulty of proven maternal descent, the challenge of presenting petitions in the proper legal form, the need to obtain the patronage of a sympathetic white lawyer, the proclamation of Indian liberty could free a few hundred slaves at most. Nonetheless, even a limited emancipation served an important psychological and rhetoric purpose. It reassured anxious Virginians that, despite failing to eliminate African slavery, their society was committed to emancipatory principles. It also rehabilitated the law from its messy but inevitable entanglement with the violence and cruelty of slavery. Lawyers could comfort themselves that the unsavory elements of old slave codes were the unfortunate but necessary holdovers of an archaic past. In the new state, the rule of law would be the protector of liberty, with lawyers and judges at its, at its guardians. The judicial abolition of Indian slavery, in short, reinforced the self-image that Virginia's revolutionary legal elite had carefully crafted humane, just, and committed to the expansion of freedom. But these factors alone cannot fully explain the decision to free enslaved natives. Virginia's legal elite had similar good intentions to end African slavery, but even measures that indirectly eroded the radical divisions in Virginia society, freeing the restrictions on manumission, for instance, were met with hostility and quickly curtailed. The consequences of the abolition of Indian slavery thus included not simply the minimal economic cost, but a potentially much greater threat that the legal justification employed could be deployed against African slavery and the racial case system. This prospect haunted the opponents of Indian emancipation as Bland's rebuttal to Mason's natural law claims in the Hudgens Court rejection of Whitty's broad principles of freedom suggests. The reformers' success in enacting the liberal principles of the revolution therefore hinged on the distinction between Indian and African slavery. The statutory history with its specific references to Indians provided some restraint, but the 17th century legislation on Africans was similarly confused. It might yield dangerous results if scrutinized too closely. You hear what is she saying? Because if you really investigate, dangerous results will happen. The shift in Virginia's racial attitudes toward Africans and Indians provided an essential social backstop for the abolition of Indian slavery by the courts. By demonstrating that Indians, unlike Africans, were entitled to some of the privileges whites enjoyed, the liberal policies toward Indian slavery could be made safe. Anglo-Virginians had long used race instrumentally to stigmatize enslaved Africans and Indians. In the late 18th century, though, the racial ideology hardened. Before that point, Virginians justified slavery to the extent they gave the matter any thought, with reference to the just war doctrine and claim that, the simply, that si they simply availed themselves on the conflicts of others. This rational reflected earlier consensus, but Virginia's burgeoning legal class knew that the dominant 18th century treatises steeped in Enlightenment human humanism rejected the claim that war alone provided a right to hold other human beings as property. Instead, Virginians turned increasingly to biological races, based on an emergent science of race that stressed in it physical differences between races. An emergent science. So he's talking about all these things happening at the same time, like Darwinism and all that. There's an emergent science, right? That started classifying people based on color instead of based on nations or tribes. All right. So this was what what the route they went for. They were like, all right, we'll free the Indians. But then we're going to say, because these are Africans or Negroes, that they don't fall under that same law. All right. But we already know Indians were being classified as Negroes, coloreds, mulattoes, free persons of color, free Negroes, free blacks. 
Virginia slave owners came to rely on the assumption of black incapacity to justify their practices. Race alone provided sufficient reason for white freedom and black bondage. Black. You keep calling yourself black. That's how they play with you. That's how they enslave you. This racial justification for slavery required coherent and easily classifiable categories. Black and white had to map onto slave and free. You hear that? Again, this racial justification for slavery required coherent and easily classifiable categories. Listen, black and white is the same as saying black is slave and white is free. So if you consider either or, you're either slave or free. All right? You keep calling yourself black. That's what you are. You are a slave. Yet racial differences never remained as pure as white planters hoped. Racial mixing thus became a constant fear of late 18th century whites who sought to control it through restrictive legislation. Despite these harsh laws, though interracial sex remained common, posing legal as well as practical difficulties, the status of offspring of the frequent rape of, by white masters of black slaves was resolved through redefinition of the word Negro to include mulattoes who were not described as any person with at least one-fourth part of more of Negro blood, all right? Mulattoes. We already know about mulattoes, right? More problematic was sex between black men and white women, which triggered especially harsh penalties, including the possible enslavement of the offending woman. Their offspring legally entitled to liberty filled the dockets of colonial and post-revolutionary courts with freedom suits, disproven planters, Peel's rhetoric about the separation of the races and the chastity of white women. And I just want to emphasize here, just because they're calling these people white didn't mean they were white Europeans. This racial melange was made more complicated by the existence of three races in Virginia, whites, blacks, and Indians. The legal and popular lumping of natives and blacks into a common racial underclass blurred the racial lines between blacks and Indians. As both runaway ads and the freedom suits proved many slaves had some Indian blood, but he's going to let us know, she's going to let us know, right, that the legal and popular lumping of natives and blacks into a common racial underclass blurred the racial lines between blacks and Indians. As both runaway ads and the freedom suits proved many slaves had some Indian blood in them. Many slaves had some. No, many slaves were Indian. Were you? Moreover, slaves often ran away to the few remaining Indian reservations where they intermingled with the inhabitants. They went to their people. You went to your people. These mixed categories challenged the ideology of coherent racial boundaries that imagined the division between free and slave as well-defined and easily ascertainable. The intellectual response to such ambiguities was to revise earlier tendencies to lump non-whites together and instead exaggerate the essential divisions between races, all right? Lump non-whites together. The emerging doctrine of scientific racism provided a convenient rationale here as well, since it posited that Indians constituted a distinct and more advanced race than Africans. You hear that? Why they call you African? For Virginians, this re-evaluation of Indians, relative advancement was possible only because of the demographic transformation that occurred over the course of the 18th century. Indians who had been so prominent in the 17th century largely vanished from Eastern Virginia. Again, Indians who had been so prominent in the 17th century largely banished from Eastern Virginia. They died from disease or warfare, blended into the black slave underclass, blended, no, it's always been you. You've been there, you did not die from disease. Yeah, a lot of you died, but you still here, you were never gone. They sent a lot of you away to other states, but a lot of you stayed there or fled westward under the pressure from expanded settlement. Only a handful of Indians remained on state uh, created reservations. So only a handful actually were allowed to be uh, classified or were able to stay uh, or, or claim their identity. 
where their supposed abandonment of their traditional culture and intermarriage with non-whites compromised their identity in Anglo-Virginian eyes. This shift meant that to whites, most Indians now lived beyond the frontier. Their affairs of diplomatic issue that did not affect day-to-day -day life in the colony. Now that they no longer threatened the colony, natives rose in the estimation of Anglo-Virginian intellectuals. The elite resurrected the myth of the noble savage, predicated on a Roman reconceptualization of essential native characteristics. Indians purported deficiencies, their unwillingness to assimilate, and their apparent and mythical choice of extermination over slavery were reconfigured as a de demonstration of their commitment to liberty. One elite Virginian even went so far as to lament the rarity of white Indian intermarriage, a striking contrast to the society's haunting fears of white black mixing. White Virginians' positive reevaluation of natives depended on the individuous comparison to the Africans. The contrast between the two races received the strongest articulation in Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, written at the end of the 18th century. Jefferson praised the eloquent fecundity and courage of the Indians while explaining away their supposed shortcomings by observing the similar primitiveness of European culture in ancient times. By contrast, blacks' physical distinctions from whites were fixed in nature and proved a difference of race. Jefferson cataloged Africans' numerous supposed deficiencies in intellect, emotions, and even scent, <laughs> and emphasized that unlike Indians, Africans had been exposed to culture, literature, and the arts, but had failed to produce any worthy achievements of their own. And drawing this contrast between noble If primitive Indians and degraded Africans, Jefferson reflected the views of the era's educated classes and demonstrated how far Virginian racial attitudes had evolved from the 17th century. Far from lumping natives and Africans together, 18th century Virginians distinguished between what they now termed the two races, individually comparing black incapacity with Indian achievement. Hmm. So black, African, again, you're hearing, right? what these terms are really. The rise of racial essentialism allowed white Virginians to separate Indians from African slavery. The enslavement of Indians became, in the words of Jefferson, an inhuman practice that once prevailed in this country. Once prevailed, you they just named you African after a certain period, or Negro. While Africans alleged natural depravity and believed to justify their enslavement, Virginians now constructed a racial justification for the abolition of Indian slavery that would not affect the hundreds of thousands of Africans held in bondage, so-called Africans. Although unimaginable a century earlier, when all people of color were lumped together into a single category, all people of color, all you guys were all together. Again, although unimaginable a century earlier, when all people of color were lumped together into a single category, Virginia had evolved into a society in which Indian freedom did not imply African freedom. Again, Indian freedom did not imply African freedom. These are just tags. In fact, just as black slavery had helped create white freedom, and Indian freedom reinforced African bondage. You hear that, right? Virginian planters could not undo a century and a half of racial mixing, but they could eliminate the antiquated and dissonant elements that now violated their racial ideology, namely the presence of a race they no longer believed deserved slavery in the midst of a race that did. The judicial abolition of Indian slavery allowed whites to perpetuate the myth that blackness was a necessary component of servitude. Blackness. You are black. Black man, black power, right? Blackness is a necessary component of servitude. Remember, black means slave and black is servitude. In the process, they effaced the rem remnants of Virginia's complex tri-racial past and divided their society firmly into white and black. All of a sudden, Indian is gone. You're either white or black. Although they never regarded natives as their equals, 
elite Virginians made Indians white to maintain their racial ideology and strengthen African enslavement. Again, elite Virginians made Indians white. What have I been saying the whole time? Again, elite Virginians made Indians white to maintain their racial ideology and strengthen African enslavement. This confluence of statutes, revolutionary liberalism, and evolving racial ideology explains why Virginian lawyers and judges decided in the late 18th century that the descendants of Indian slaves deserved freedom. There was, however, a fourth and equally vital factor. The actions of these slave, the, the slaves themselves, their voices do not survive in the archive, archive unmediated. Instead, they are filtered through the lawyers who drafted their petitions and the judges who decided their cases. But their actions alone suggest their role in forcing the abolition of Indian slavery. Many historians have interpreted slaves' actions as acts of resistance and like slave rebellions or the decision to run away, freedom suits demonstrated slaves' deep dissatisfaction with the hostility to the institution of slavery. But claiming freedom in a court demonstrated a more complicated relationship to white dominance than outright rejection. Such claims hint at the existence of slaves' own legal consciousness distinct from that of the masters and the courts. Slaves certainly were aware of legal change. Consider, for instance, the testimony presented in Hudgens that the people in the neighborhood told Hannah, the forebearer of the plaintiffs, that if she would try for her freedom, she would get it. A parallel situation occurred in a later case in which it was currently said and believed in the neighborhood that Sybil, the maternal ancestor of the plaintiffs, was entitled to her freedom. In another instance, knowledge of the general court decision in Robin evidently quickly spread to the two runaways who supposedly fled to Williamsburg to file suit, along with the multitude of other slaves who claimed Indian descent after the ruling. These episodes highlight the informal, informational networks that disseminated legal news to slaves and connected such slaves to each other and to the broader society. The actions of these runaways further complicate the simple portrayal of slave resistance. Running away was itself illegal. The suggestion that slaves would then attempt to file a court claim suggests not opposition to the institution of slavery itself, since they might just as easily have attempted to flee altogether as most slaves did, but a belief in a legal right to freedom. So he's saying that these people could have just ran away and be free and go to the north and never been seen again. But they believed in this freedom. They knew they were Indian. They, 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 they wouldn't want to be hiding and stuff. So they decided to go fight for their freedom. Right? Freedom suits resulted. Then from slaves insisted that the law backed their claims, not those of their masters. The other snippets suggest that Robin and its progeny inspired a similar rights consciousness in other slaves. After Hannah's brother brother brought suit to recover his freedom, Hannah evidently made an almost continual claim as to her right of freedom, and in so much that she was threatened to be whipped by her master for mentioning the subject. Her descendants, who quickly filed their petition when they were to be taken from the country, apparently also believed they enjoyed a legal right to freedom. In these instances, slaves did not resist the law slave owners created and imposed upon them but they modified it to craft their own legal understandings and justifications that cast them and not their owners as the lawful members of society. Yet slaves who claimed descent from Indians did not simply acquiesce in the hegemonic legal order. They helped create the legal doctrine that led to their freedom. The slaves who perceived the possibility of freedom forced judges to confront the issue of Indian slavery filing lawsuit after lawsuit. The persistence widened what had been a narrow legal exception into a general presumption for Indian freedom. We have at last the full account of why a series of court cases in late 18th century Virginia judicially abolished Indian slavery, an institution that a century earlier had been nearly as prevalent and important as African slavery 
the emancipation of the descendants of Indian slaves resulted from the confluence of a contradictory and malleable statutory history, post-revolutionary emancipatory principles, shifting racial attitudes and slaves, own legal consciousness and insistence upon their rights. The effect of this transformation extended beyond the immediate consequence of freedom for the plaintiffs and their descendants. The Virginian cases helped reconfigure the racial order and race issues that continue to resound in debates over race and identity today. Again, this goes and continues until today. Debates over race and identity today. What's going on right now? Why are you here watching this video? Making Indians White, the judicial abolition of native slavery and revolutionary Virginia and its racial legacy. This is part four of this article, White and Black Indians and the Erasure of the Triracial Past, part A, Outward from Virginia. The effects of Virginia's debate over the legality of Indian slavery soon spread beyond the state's borders. This expansion was in part a direct effect as Virginia exported many of its slaves throughout the South. It exported its thorny legal issues as well. In Vaughan and Fee, for instance, a Tennessee slave imported from Virginia claimed descent from an Indian. Ironically, a slave owned by Thomas Hardaway, the defendant and Robin, plaintiff's counsel argued that the evidentiary law of Virginia, which would have allowed the plaintiff to prove her Indian descent by hearsay, should control or else a person as free as any of us would be transformed to a slave by the wonderful magic of crossing a state line. The court agreed with plaintiff's counsel. So they're saying if the, that applied to Hardin and Robin, then it should apply to this person as well. The court agreed with plaintiff's counsel. It noted that as a matter of substantive Virginia law, all American Indians and their descendants are prima facie free and held that Virginia's evidentiary law applied to the case before it. In short, as Virginia slaves diffused throughout the South, the racial and legal ideology that made Indians as free as any of us whites traveled with them. The legacy of Robin literally in this is instance moved westward and southward as new areas opened to slavery. The influence of Virginia's freedom cases also steamed from the legal debate they occasioned in other states over the legality of Indian slavery. In some places, including New Jersey and Louisiana, courts explicitly rejected the lawyers' claims that proof of being Indian is equivalent to proof of freedom. So they didn't, they didn't accept that stuff. They were like, nah. Even though the court admired the Virginian doctrines on Indian slavery because they were liberal and honorable to the respectable judges who, by whom they have been delivered, yet elsewhere states either explicitly or implicitly had followed Virginia's lead and declared Indian slavery illegal. In 1847, the South, Supreme Court of South Carolina overturned a case in which the trial judge had instructed the jury that there were only two races in the state, whites and blacks, wow, and held that as a matter of law and human sentiment, Indian slavery could no longer exist. The opinion depicted the freeborn savage as a vanished people who once roamed independently through his own forest, holding the sparse remnants of the red man or copper-colored man in bondage would be cruel. As for the law, the court stressed the need for committee with our sister states, especially the ancient dominion of Virginia. This opinion underscores that the legacy of Robin persisted well into the 19th century and diffused throughout the courts of the antebellum United States, both directly through judicial precedent and indirectly through racial ideology. The legal problem of deciding where Indians fit in society divided between blacks and whites recurred outside the context of Indian slavery. A contemporaneous case from Ohio's addressed the question of whether the descendants of Indians could vote in a state that limited the franchise to whites. Since the state's constitution established only three racial categories, whites, blacks, and mulattoes. We already know about mulattoes, Dr. the hijack with all these tags. The court, after noting that Indian offspring served as clerks of court and were members of the bar in Ohio, determined that all nearer white than black or of the grade between the mulattoes and the whites were entitled to enjoy every political and social privilege of the white citizen. You hear that, right? 
the Ohio Supreme Court does face the same problem that confronted the Virginian courts and resolved it in the same fashion. Although Indians were not whites, listen to this, please. Very important part right here. Although Indians were not whites, social equals, their ambiguous existence and between whites and blacks impelled courts to legally classify them as whites to uphold the racial case system. So Indians were being classified as whites, not because they were white or European, because it impelled courts to legally classify them that way to uphold the racial case system. So part B, Robin's last and legacy. Whiteness is so often asserted as a privilege in American society that it is easy to assume that the racial redefinition of Robin began was a boon to Indians. But Indian whiteness was a limited and contingent right that did not imply racial equality with whites. It coexisted with the emerging conception among Anglo-Americans and natives that Indians were the red or copper colored, right? Members of a separate race. It also did not prevent centuries of race-based hostility that marginalized Indians as inferior. Indian whiteness, in parentheses, right, was defined primarily as a negative. Indians were not black. Even this limited grant of whiteness had pernicious long-term consequences for Indians. Although the ideology of Robin granted freedom to slaves who could prove native ancestry, it also suggested that Indians, unlike blacks, were close enough to whites assimilable. Anglo-Americans enacted this dogma by attempting to erase a distinct Indian identity. The primary agent in this policy was the federal government, which sought for most of American history to force Indians to conform to the conventions of white culture. The results for tribes were disastrous, eroding sovereignty and cultural identity. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, this attempt consisted largely of the civilization policy a concerted effort to turn tribes away from their traditional economies and convert them into sedentary farmers. The 1887 Dawes Act forcibly imposed this goal on Indians living on reservations. We got a little bit of the Dawes Act right before. By parceling communal tribal land into individual farming plots and selling off the excess with the aim of undermining tribal identity. This policy was reinforced by the common practice of forcing Indian children into boarding schools to kill the Indian. You hear this, right? Forcing Indian children into boarding schools to kill the Indian and save the man, they said. And by a series of Supreme Court cases affirming federal plenary power to regulate tribes, internal affairs even in violation of treatises that granted tribal sovereignty. Although in the 1930s, the Indian New Deal's restoration of Indian self-determination rectified some of the damage these 19th century policies caused. After the Second World War, the federal government returned to a policy of acculturation known as termination, by which it sought largely unsuccessfully to end its relationship with tribes and encourage Indians to move to large cities in the hope that they would assimilate. Courts have recognized Indian rights to self-government and cultural autonomy only since the 1970s. You hear that? It is not so easy to escape history, however. The legal definition of Indian status remains a contested judicial and political issue, no longer because it confers freedom from slavery, but because enrollment in a federally recognized tribe that determines jurisdiction and taxation confers the right to health care and other federal services and occasionally provides substantial revenue from tribal income. You hear all this? Why it's so controversial right now? Robin's legacy persists here too. By defining Indians as equivalent to whites, Robin implied that Indians could not simultaneously be black. So they couldn't be black. Not that you could be dark-skinned, but considered black, a tag, a title, a slave. This separation of natives and Africans made the possession of multiple legal identities impossible. 
despite the existence of numerous intermixed groups of black Indians, in parentheses, black Indians, throughout the United States. Two present-day legal struggles, one in Virginia, the other in Oklahoma, underscore the significant implications with doctrine has had for modern determination of Indianness. This is here part one, the Virginia tribes and the ongoing struggle for federal recognition. Although Virginia elites assumed after Robin that natives had disappeared from their society, Indians hid in the plain sight, subsumed into the free black population of the state. Indians hid in plain sight. You are there in plain sight. You've been there. Subsumed into the free black population. Free black, that was always you. Free colored, we already know this. Despite significant intermixing, the law maintained a strict division between Indians and blacks. Only natives with less than one quarter African blood were considered Indians, while the rest were labeled colored. Colored. So they were doing meeny, meeny, miny, mo. He's colored. He's Indian. He's colored. He's Indian. He's colored. Indian. 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 Colored. Indian. Yeah, they were just throwing words out there, classifying the descendants of Indians even possess court-issued certificates that testify to their native ancestry and protected them from the numerous legal restrictions imposed upon free blacks. So much changes when they labeled you something else. When your neighbor could be your cousin, your brother, and he's uh, entitled to political right privileges, social privileges that you're not. The need for such documents suggests that Virginian Indians appeared physically indistinguishable from their African-American neighbors in the eyes of whites. Again, the need, listen up, the need for such documents. Why do you need to prove, why do you need to prove you're an Indian if Indians and Africans are supposed to look totally different? But the reality is that Indians to the white Virginians appeared physically indistinguishable from their African-American neighbors because it's all you. It's the same person. It's the same family. In the eyes of the whites, in the 1920s, eugenicists even concluded that the remnants of the Virginian tribes could not possibly be true Indians since they looked black. And who's the dude who started eugenics, the eugenics movement? I believe it was Charles Darwin's brother. You don't look black. You can't look black. They're saying that you were dark skinned. They're saying that you look like a Negro. That these Indians can't be true Indians because they look like Negroes. That's what they're saying. The response was a series of so-called racial integrity. Laws that, among other provisions, excluded anyone with more than 1 16th Indian blood from being white. An Indian identity was finally erased from Virginian records. Legally, all Virginians became either black or white. Either black or white. Virginia had at last completed the long process of Robin began of dismantling Indians' ambiguous racial status. It had obliterated the state's triracial past from its laws. Although repealed, the Racial Integrity Act continued to have pernicious consequences for Virginia's Indians in the present. To achieve federal recognition, tribes must meet seven separate criteria, the first of which is proof of continuous existence since 1900, with all mention of them absent from the state records after 1924. Virginia's tribes could not achieve recognition through the standard method of petitioning the Office of Acknowledgement within the Bureau of Indian Affairs. You hear this? What's going on? The games they play? The sole alternative is federal legislation, which offers its own challenges. Congress is often reluctant to interfere in a matter it believes best left out to the BIA. And the process of recognition often devolves into polit politicized struggles over Indian gaming and land rights. Six Virginian tribes have sought federal recognition through congressional legislation since 2000, but they have only recently made progress after they accepted provisions barring casinos. Still, recognition is not assured. A bill to grant federal recognition to the six tribes passed the House in both the 110th and 111th congressional sessions. 
The Senate Indian Affairs Committee approved a Senate version of the House bill in the first session, but the version failed to pass before the recent adjournment. Given the support of Virginia's congressional delegation, it seems likely that the Virginia tribes will at last achieve federal recognition, albeit only after great difficulty. Their situation, however, is not unique. Other tribes have faced similar hurdles to recognition because the states classified them as white or black. So even when you were given the privilege of political and social privileges because you were white, it's messing you up now because now you're not even Indian because you, you were classified as black or white rather than Indians. The Lumbee of North Carolina have petitioned repeatedly but unsuccessfully for federal recognition since 1870. The Shinnecock on Long Island, Shinnecock, right? We got this on part one. Who's from the Shinnecock tribe? Oh, dirty bastard, right? On Long Island finally received federal recognition in 2010 after a long wait in part because they appear african-american to outsiders because they appear what so what does that mean when you say somebody appears they look negro that's what they're saying they are negroes they've been here american indians and it's insistence that indians and blacks are separate peoples and it's assurance of the triracial past the doctrine of robin continues to undermine the tribe's ability to achieve federal recognition making indians white part four section two the Oklahoma tribes and the legal battles over tribal membership. Tribes have also wrestled with historical legacy of Indian whiteness and controversies over membership. Federally recognized tribes have the power to establish their own criteria for tribal membership. In 1975, the Cherokee Nation enacted a provision restricting membership to descendants of individuals labeled as Cherokee on the Dawes Commission rolls, which were compiled in the 1890s to allot land under the Dawes Act. While such descent provisions are common among Indian tribes, in the Cherokee instance, this restriction had significant racial consequences. When federal officials compiled the Dawes roll, they subscribed to the notion that Indians could not be black and vice versa. You hear this? So when they did this Dawes roll, they already came in with a, a, you know, a hijacked mind, you know, a presumption that Indians could not be black or people of dark skin, not black, right? And vice versa. They therefore divided the Cherokee into those whom they considered actually Indian, labeling them as Cherokee and those they perceived as black, whom they labeled freedmen. Many of the freedmen had been slaves of the Cherokee and possessed significant amounts of Cherokee blood, but they were regarded as ineligible for Cherokee identity because of their racial identity. By limiting tribal membership to those labeled Cherokee on these documents, the Cherokee nation excluded most descendants of Cherokee slaves, as well as many others who seemed to the 1890s classifiers to be more black than Indian. The question of Cherokee identity had become an ongoing legal battle. In 2006, the Cherokee Supreme Court overturned the restriction on membership and required the admission of the freedmen. Less than a year later, a popular referendum amended the, notions constitute, the nation's constitution to reinstate the restrictive membership language. The Cherokee District Court, however, recently struck down that amendment. At the same time, the dispute had proceeded in federal court, where the plaintiffs had alleged that the restrictive membership requirements violate an 1866 treaty between the United States and the Cherokee, which guaranteed freedmen tribal membership. The latest ruling by D.C. Circuit in 2008 addressed questions of tribal sovereignty and allowed the suit to continue, but the final outcome remains uncertain. Other tribes, notably the Seminole, have included similar restrictions that exclude black members, so-called black, or people that are dark-skinned, which have also resulted in litigation. Such conflicts are the product of history in a double sense. Most obviously, they st stem from the Dawes Rose assumption grounded in the racial ideology of Hudgens, that Indians and Africans are distinct races with different essences. So. This is just a notion, an ideology. It's not tr true. 
and it's not Africans, remember, I'm talking about Negroes, people of dark skin. But the restrictions also suggest the adoption of a version of this ideology by natives themselves. Although proponents of the membership restrictions have insisted that they seek only to preserve tribal rights to self-government, there is significant evidence that racial animus was at least a partial motive for the restrictions. Such hostility should be viewed in its historical context, from Robin onward. What few privileges natives could secure, freedom from slavery, ability to vote, or the right of self-government, came by distancing themselves from African Americans and Anglo-American conceptions. Modern tribes' insistence on their separateness is understandable given this history. Once employed by Virginia's courts to claim that Indian freedom did not threaten African slavery, Native whiteness now excludes Afro-Native descendants from the present-day privileges of Indian identity. You see the games they played and the system they set up, right? So it, you lead, you basically end up in two dead ends because they created all these classifications and all these tags, right? And these legal terms, right? Now, number three, part four of this article, Indians Equal Protection and the Black-White Paradigm. The role of race in Indian law remains ambiguous. The Supreme Court determined in 1974 that legal classification of a person as an Indian is a political, not a racial classification based on tribal affiliation and the historic trust relationship between the United States and tribes. You hear that? After this determination, equal protection clause challenges to statutes granting special privileges to tribal members were dismissed. Such decisions protect tribes since the strict scrutiny applied to racial classification would prove fatal to the numerous rights and privileges that rest entirely on an individual's Indian status. And Indian status continues to possess a racial component, however. Some tribes continue to use blood quantum to define membership, the same technique that Virginia lawmakers used in the 18th century to determine who was white, black, and mulatto. Federal common law and statutory definitions of who is an Indian often rely on ancestry or blood, as well as tribal membership. This ambiguity between political and racial identity perpetuates the confusion over Indian status long present in American history. Many scholars of Indian law have argued for the elimination of the racial component of Indian identity. They argue that jurisprudence of race law developed in the context of the black-white binary does not apply to the unique historical and legal position of American Indians. They have also suggested that founders' understanding of natives enshrined in the Constitution was as separate sovereigns outside the American polity with whom the federal government had political relationship. The history presented in this comment both affirms and contextualizes these claims. As Robin and his progeny demonstrate, the black-white paradigm that has long dominated American understanding of race applies poorly to natives, precisely because its creation rested on the implicit erasure of an earlier triracial history. It could exist only when Indians had disappeared from Anglo-American society, disappeared in parentheses. You are still here. This amnesia also allowed the founders to understand Indians primarily as sovereign tribes outside the government of the United States, since in their minds, Indians behind the frontier had largely vanished. Those who still claimed Indian identity within Euro-American settlements were either ignored or regarded, as Jefferson's descriptions of, Vir of the Virginia tribes illustrate, as something less than real. Indians, because they no longer looked or acted as Indians should. Modern scholars reject the trope of the disappearing Indian, but they have embraced this version of the history of Indians as quasi-outsiders because it serves important political and legal ends, emphasizing native separateness from the political and legal institutions of the United States provides a valuable counter-narrative to toward ongoing efforts to reduce tribal sovereignty and self-governance. Yet there are costs to following the path of Robin, ignoring the triracial past in which the descendants of American Indians often oppressed, marginalized, or enslaved, did live within Anglo-American society. Assuming natives' outsider status plays into long-standing views of Indians as peoples of the past who are still not truly part of American society. Most American Indians no longer live on reservations, 
Again, most American Indians no longer live on reservations. But the fixed sense that natives have always lived apart means that for most 21st century Americans, as for the jurists of 18th century Virginia, the Indians who live among them are invisible. Again, the Indians, you, so-called Negro, that live among these people of the 18th century Virginia, right, were invisible. You weren't considered an Indian anymore. You were black or white. Depicting the status of American Indians as Sioux genetics also blinds us to the broader commonalities between natives and other minorities. Placed in perspective, the complex history of Indians and their racial status before the law presented here is actually quite typical. After all, natives were not the only group in a legally nebulous area between black and white. Hispanics, Asians, and even Irish, Italian, and Jewish immigrants have had similar experiences. These are all tags, by the way. These parallels reinforce a point legal scholars have increasingly emphasized, the diverse nature of American society and the obsolescence of the black-white legal paradigm. The history presented here shows that the legal division of society into black and white has always been artificial. Again, the history presented here, what I'm showing you right now in this article, in this video right now, I'm telling you right now, the article's telling you, the scholarly uh, professor from a university, right? It's telling you that the history presented here shows that the legal division of society into black and white has always been artificial. It doesn't exist. It's an illusion. It's made up. Courts and legislatures manufactured this separation and imposed it on a much more complicated racial reality. And you still go and buy that. You still believe in people. You still calling yourself black. You still call yourself African or white. You think you're white because you're light skinned. And you think you're better than your dark skinned brother. The recognition that Indians played as fundamental a role in the construction of early American racial ideology, as Africans did, helps us to recognize that modern American diversity and its legal challenges is actually one of the country's oldest historical legacies. The lessons of this history are complex and do not lend themselves readily to policy pronouncements for the future. But these examples of the present day impact of Robin do suggest several conclusions. The first is the lasting damage done by the racial ideology that insists that a person has but a single racial identity. The Indians cannot also be black, for instance. That is the hijack. That is the indoctrination they've put in us. All right. That's just an example she's showing you. She's telling you. In 2000, the U.S. Census allowed participants to check off more than one box for race for the first time. But officials continued to assign re respondents to a single race. As the Virginia and Oklahoma litigation suggests, such classifications can have a long and pernicious afterlife. The law should reflect the ways people self-identify more closely and prevent official but ill informed categorizations from hardening into firm, judicially enforced boundaries. The second conclusion concerns judicial application of the Equal Protection Clause. The vast literature on this constitutional provision and its application to issues of race and discrimination is beyond the scope of this comment. So there's so much info that exists, she's telling you. To prove this, to, to what she's stating, there's so much info out there for you to research. But it is worth considering one implication of the long history presented here. One key criterion courts have applied in determining whether a law employs a suspect classification is whether the class has faced a history of discrimination. The paradigmatic instance being African Americans, experiences with slavery and segregation. This perspective suggests that the more easily a group's past can be analogized to that of Blacks, the more deserving that group is of protect protection. But the experience of Indians suggests that being declared white and being subjected to forced assimilation could constitute just as profound an experience of this discrimination. So, you see, I just wanted to show you this article because you were not only being labeled Black, but also white, and that didn't help you out either. Many minorities in American history, most notably, given recent legal struggles, gay men and women, dodge the hijack here, have faced profound persecution. 
that pressured them not to separate from mainstream society, but to conform to it. You know, all respect to whatever you want to do, but I don't think this counts as the same. Nothing to do with the struggles of so-called Indians and so-called blacks in America. Please do not compare that to that. Now let's get to the conclusion of this article. And thank you for being here. Conclusion. None of the participants in Robin versus Hardaway knew they were transforming the legal ideology of race in 18th century Virginia. The plaintiffs saw only a potential avenue towards freedom. The judges saw only an intricate legal question that required careful statutory interpretation. Only what's said against the larger context of what came before and after does it become clear that Robin marked an important transition. It would be too much to claim that Robin alone caused the shift from a legally triracial to a biracial society. The course of history was never that straightforward. Freedom came to enslave descendants of natives only after re the revolution spread an emancipatory ideology. A demographic shift triggered the reevaluation re of whites, conceptions of Indians, and the enslaved plaintiffs' own persistence forced Virginia's legal elite repeatedly to confront the issue. So only because they were like being hypocrites, right? They were fighting for their freedom against Britain, but then they were enslaving Indians. So they had to go with that because they couldn't be hypocrites to what they were pushing with the whole revolution thing, right? Yet once Virginia had judicially abolished Indian slavery, its precedent spread quickly to other states. Virginia's actions were thus em emblematic of a moment of larger racial transition, one that cast Indians as simultaneously assimilable and banishing and, and African Americans as inherently inferior. So they killed your title or your identity as an Indian, right? It vanished, supposedly, and then you became African American, which was inherently inferior. You still call yourself that. Neither of these racial definitions proved advantages for these groups. Neither African Americans faced years of enslavement and segregation, but Indians selectively granted the privileges of whiteness, endured insistent and violent efforts to recast them as Anglo-Americans and redescription as fake or black Indians when they failed to comply. The 21st century United States is very different from 18th century Virginia, but it retains traces of Robin's legacy by separating Indians from blacks. A stubbornly persistent racial ideology still confounds tribal efforts to achieve federal recognition and mixed race struggles to achieve tribal membership. It has also helped to reify the legal separation between black and white and to obliterate a more complex colonial past. One of the most striking parallels between then and now, though, is indirect. This comment has argued that law and society are interwoven. The abolition of Indian slavery was impossible without the broad shift in white Virginians' racial ideals. Moreover, the judicial change chronicled here did not come simply from the top down. Virginia's highest judges decided that the law should change, but it was the slave who forced the judges hand by insisting upon their legal rights and continually bringing freedom suits before the courts. It's because you fought for yourself. Are you still doing that right now? In this historical case, at least it was the lowliest members of society who helped create and define judicial doctrine. 21st century Americans are participating in similar moments of racial reconfiguration. Again, right now, 21st century Americans, you so-called Negro, you're participating in a similar moment of racial reconfiguration because they've been calling you black, Negro, colored, African all these years. For the past 60 years, society and the courts have sought to undo the prejudices of three and a half centuries, even as American society has become more diverse than ever. Race and racial prejudice have not vanished from America or from our legal system. But Robin's example suggests that persistent struggle by those on the margins can and did affect dramatic change. So what is she telling you? She's subliminally telling us that it's up to us, up to us to make the change, up to us to make the change. Again, 
This was the article, Making Indians White, the Judicial Abolition of Native Slavery in Revolutionary Virginia and its Racial Legacy, says Gregory Ablaski. JD uh, candidate, 2001 PhD candidate, 2014 in American Legal History, University of Pennsylvania. All right. So dodge the hijack when people throw in the word pseudo at you. Do some research on your own. So you can see it's verifiable history. It's not pseudo. It's law. It's history. And it happened. And that's why you are called African-American today. Or you were considered white. Hey, oh. Oh,